reality, but my fault. Just to say thank you, um, Georgian Society, for inviting me. It's, it's very timely and it's a privilege to be part of this conference. Just the first thing I want to do, I suppose, on, on reflection in preparing this, um, I think we've come a long way. And uh, I think looking back, I think we can be encouraged and to a good extent satisfied. But it's also been a remarkably strange and unreal time in which all of this has happened. And I think it would be right to say that without statutory protection and all that it has brought, all that it has brought in terms of where we're at today, this conference, the network of conservation officers, heritage officers, civic trusts, the professional in infrastructure, the conservation accreditation, be 10 years old in the RIAI next year, Without all of this, I think one shudders to think what that tiger might have managed to gobble up and destroy. Mm -hmm. So, where's this? I think there's widespread acceptance and wider understanding that we've moved on. And if I can borrow a phrase from an advert some of you might remember, could you show me a leaper? I think we've moved on from, could you show me the cartilage? So, broadly, the transfer from ratification of international policy to national policy to legislation to guidance to practice to physical outcomes has, I think, brought a level of certainty and clarity that sometimes is absent in other forms of development. And there is a very well-skilled and notably still remarkably committed community, not quite exhausted, but perhaps getting there. So I'm talking about principles. And I want to very briefly look at, I have the I suppose, synopsis or the summary of the department's own principles set out in the guidelines. And I'm not really proposing to go into them in, in, in enormous detail. Suffice to say, there's a few comments I want to put onto them. And then I'm going to expand a little bit on some, I suppose, some principles or thoughts or ideas that have come out of my own practice mingling with everybody and, and hearing and, and, and listening and, and really thinking about them as, I suppose, um, prompts in a way for, for, the, for the future. So as I say, I, I, I found it difficult somehow looking back 10, 12 years under, under the legislation at a time which has been and continues to be somewhat unreal in terms of life beforehand. There's been two great ages the Celtic tiger was not an animal of this earth, and the current great age of austerity is an unnatural climate. So in this light, we do need principles. And when we think, the dictionary defines it as fundamental truths or law as a basis for reasoning or action. So we're dealing really with the fundamentals and not the details. So just looking at the existing, and I'm just highlighting a few here, and keeping a building in use, it's come up already, it's going to come up again. It remains fundamental. And uh, I believe that apart from the use being intrinsic to the safeguarding of the building, I think a huge amount of the value of any building resides with its use. And there's very few, really very, very few, maybe a handful of buildings in this country that might be so important that you would say they could be put beyond use. So I think it's, it's critical and it drives an awful lot of our approach and I think in the future uh, uh, um, I think we, we, we are and we will increasingly look at our built heritage stock as a resource and use becomes critical again. The principles using expert conservation advice and protecting the special interest and kind of coupling together which might seem strange but the point really simply being made is that dealing with these buildings and dealing with this context is beyond one individual. It's beyond one piece of expertise and I suppose that's what the 10 years has done. It has broadened that landscape but really into territory that many of us here are not familiar with. So the protecting of the special interest, I mean even if you think of the eight, the eight categories of special interest within the guidelines, you're dealing with social and cultural and historical. But also our interpretation and our understanding of heritage goes beyond that. It embraces the natural and the built combined. It is the setting and the context. So it is indeed sometimes beyond heritage. So I think we, we, we need to consider those two together. Promoting honesty of repair and alterations. 
Sometimes, in my view, there has been a, maybe an overkill in the implementation of this, an overkill on new against old pastiche, succumbing to cliches of shiny glass and steel against old stone and brick. Don't get me wrong, done well, that can be exquisite. However done poorly, it can result in the proverbial dog stare. I haven't shown any examples because I, I don't want to, but we can all imagine. And ensuring reversibility. Now, I'm asking, is this always appropriate? I think very often it will. It's really, really useful. And I'm a bit unfair here because this uh, is Dunleary Harbour. And I'm just referring to, uh, which I, I, I've said I've come to do quite a bit of work in, but before we got involved, and this is before the legislation, the breakwaters were designed. But I was informed that they were designed in a way which they were reversible. Now let's cop on to ourselves. You know, they're going to be around for a hell of a long time. The point is, and there was care taken in, in the design of those, we have to design for um, the realities as, as well. Okay, my own principles or principles or thoughts I want to talk about in a sense of expansion. And it's not rocket science, it's come out of practice. Many of them echo the existing principles. Um, some of them are, 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 uh, are, as I say, personal. I'm an architect, so design, quality, and beauty matters, and I make absolutely no apology for this, although I also love grit, complexity, and imperfection. The principles also possibly reflect the changing approach to conservation, which Giardo Licciardi at the Heritage Council's uh, Places Resource Conference last year referred to, and he identified this approach as evolved over time from a position of do no harm, thus avoiding damage of the cultural heritage assets in infrastructural projects, to specific interventions, which typically comprised investment on single cultural heritage assets, to now where an integrated approach seeks to integrate cultural heritage in local economic development, considering both tangible and intangible assets and comprehensively with a specific focus on historic city generation. So I'm going to, that's, you're actually not going to see that list at all again, but it was just a way of getting my head around it. And some of them there, the red ones, good judgment, time, aligning conservation objectives with other, with, with other objectives, access and inclusion, are kind of inherent in, in them all. So um, just moving swiftly along, point is, and I think Martin made it well, there are commonalities, certainly within architecture, across the broad sphere of architecture, whether you're working on a historic building or new, and each link to the other. The knowledge we gained in developing historic mortars in Ardfert led to possibilities for exploring different finishes for a floor on the East Pier in Dunleary. So this thing of connection, they're not separate. Conservation is a design process. Again, City Hall down in the bottom right hand corner, huge design decisions made in deciding to remove the historic layers, which again is kind of challenging some of the principles. So each time there are decisions to be made. Architectural, um, sorry, that was supposed to go forward. Architectural historic research is not an end in itself. It's incredibly <coughs> useful. It should be done at the outset on a building and it's a design tool, as well as all of what we can gather in understanding a place. This is just a, a, a building in Perugia in Italy where research informed a completely radical form of circulation and opening up historic parts of, of, of a building. The idea of collaboration, again, I kind of mentioned it before, incredibly important and in the sense it's the manner in which we go about uh, looking at and understanding our places from, as I've said, say the conservation plan which is taking a holistic, integrated, multidisciplinary view to site. Unfortunately, the kind of way in which I suppose procurement happens today is it's creating fragmentation in, in the stages and that's not helpful. So in a sense, I think this collaboration, which in fact, and I know within conservation practice is extremely well practiced, um, 
is being challenged and threatened, as I say, by a lot of the kind of dictates that are coming down on how a project is, is managed and procured, and indeed uh, introducing adversarial climates when really that's not going to help. Ultimately, the building work, the conservation work, that's going to last an awfully long time. Craftsmanship. I, this is incredibly important, and it's not, again, resides purely on the scaffold. Some of you have heard me mention Richard Sennett, who's a sociologist and wrote a wonderful book on craftsmanship. Uh, and he makes the claim that material culture matters, that people can learn about themselves through the things they make. Both thinking and feeling are contained within the process of making, and that we can achieve a far more humane material life if only we better understand the making of things. He refers to the 10,000 hours, seven years, it takes to become an expert. No surprise that that's the typical apprenticeship of a traditional craftsman. Senate argues craftsmanship names an enduring basic impulse, a desire to do a job well for its own sake. Craftsmanship is more than a state of mind, it has a sharp social edge. Therefore the head and the hand of the craftsman are linked intellectually and socially. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reading from this paper because I think I'll be swifter. Modesty is a virtue and a skill. I just want to draw your attention, the bottom left hand corner is a really exquisite piece of repair work, a single project done by John Hegarty, 4M in Cork, just repairing the door. You know, that's sometimes all that's needed. Comfortable fit, the tongue is a little bit in cheek here, but maybe, um, Nonetheless, very, very exquisite. But here, this idea of kind of comfortable fit and benign occupancy. Now, not all buildings can allow that, but this is an old pumping station in Wapping in, in East London. And the owners moved in, left all the machinery, and put in a new floor, a counter, and it's a restaurant and an, and an art centre. And it works very well. And when we can do that, we can, I suppose, that is the kind of exemplary living within, within the existing really important to me is this idea of the aesthetic whole, the, 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 the ultimate integrity. And again, this is the, the reconstruction of the facade of the Altus Pinakothek, anyway, the, the museum in Munich by Hans Dahlgast. It does promote honesty of repair and alteration, but there is an integrity. The eye reads the completeness of it. That takes great skill. I suppose Chipperfield, and Julian Harp, David Chipperfield and Julian Harp, Harp have continued that in the Noyes Gallery in Berlin. Um, what I would say about this project, because I had the privilege of a tour before it opened, is, is that what you see, in a sense, conforms with a lot of the principles of conservation, but the process probably uh, cut close to the wind. <laughs> I'll say no more. <laughs> anyway, it's very important. Now, my remaining slides are kind of going out from these very clear, clearer, maybe personal diktats. But in a way, if you think of them possibly as a question that within a development plan or a planning application might need to answer, how are these, and it could be applied to the other ones, how are these principles answered and addressed? And again, because of the theme of this session, it's more within the urban context, so I apologize for that. Use, I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but I'm just saying it's endless and it and elusive. It's endless because the building work never ends, and I think we all know that when we're dealing with it, but it also is so important in, in, in the energy and vitality it gives, which I've already said. But my own view again, and it's, it's where you have a good use for a building. Now this won't necessarily apply to all buildings, so one has to discriminate of course, but where you have a good and desirable use, and you know the brief then sometimes you can actually be far more interventionist than you would at a kind of a, 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 spe, a speculative approach. So my own feeling is a speculative approach to conservation is very difficult, and I think that's classically what Jim has collided with in his perfect storm in, in, in Merrion Square, is because it's trying to deal for ultimate scenarios where we're all trained with specific solutions, and we need to somehow reconcile that. Um, I won't go on on use, but uh, I, 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 for those of you, 
Jane Jacobs talks about the value of ordinary old buildings so wonderfully in her book, and I commend you to it. Um, and the other thing I suppose about use is the value of the temporary we're coming to, to learn. And I think the temporary is maybe not just here for the austerity age. Uh, this is liquid life, as the sociologist Sigmund Bauman would have it. It's the age of mobility and liquidity. And just to say again, in terms of use, this principle of sometimes, this is the, the, the old windmill, but where there is a proposal for a specific use, it can allow kind of a, 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 an interesting use clash and you can get a positive charge generated by the combined spark. Heritage as a resource. And I put up this building, which is the old power station in Poolbeg. This is no ordinary building. It thankfully doesn't come across most people's desks too often. It's no ordinary place. But how do we look at it? The place itself is fascinating and layered with rich and profound histories which resonate well beyond the Poolbeg Peninsula. Associations with the development, growth and continued viability of the port origin of one of our nation's founding components of economic and development infrastructure and a place of rare ecology amongst many other. However, is it too much to keep or too much to replace? How do we look at it? And places like Coventry, so this idea of heritage regeneration as a catalyst for development, but also as a way of recovering maybe older legibilities of our cities. So we learn to negotiate and navigate our way around the city through opening up parts of the history. And that was a very interesting project done some years ago now. Okay, lovely. Um, just going to talk very briefly on this idea of beyond the individual building. Because I think I said that from the word, the Giardo, Gildo's, Ricciardi's comments, we've moved in a sense beyond, not to say that the individual is, is no longer relevant, but we're looking at the kind of broader its context. And thinking about this idea of collective development and amalgamation. And I've just three towns in Ireland, in High, Dublin, and, and Drogheda. And just this idea of can we get our buildings working together? And we've been looking at it a little bit, um, on, on a study we're doing at the moment, and just this principle here, and it's just a diagram, and you only have to go across the way in a sense and see maybe the Dublin Dental Hospital has done it to some extent, uh, the old Healy's building, Henry J. Lyons office in Pierce Street, and this is a, a building in Bond Street has done it. But this idea of taking existing, which is the blue, new, and space, and connecting them, and maybe in a bigger planning context, working with existing parking, existing public spaces. Or on a larger scale there, where you have a larger group of buildings that might not all be connected, but around a courtyard. I think it's just dusting down old principles. So, we've moved beyond the individual building into wider urban context, and we can travel further into deeper, broader territory, requiring many inputs and embracing the tangible and the intangible. So we look at the historic city as an accumulation of meanings woven through time. And this complexity has been recognized in UNESCO's uh, recently adopted recommendation on historic landscapes. And if you allow me, I'll just give you the definition, or maybe not, but anyway, it describes the historic, and this, I want to talk about language anyway, it describes the historic landscape as an urban area understood as the result of historic layering of cultural and natural values and attributes, extending beyond the notion of historic centre or ensemble to include the broader urban context and its geographical setting. This wider context includes notably the site's topography, geomorphology, hydrology and natural features, its built environment, both historic and contemporary, its infrastructures above and below ground its open spaces and gardens, its land use patterns, its spatial organisations, perceptions and visual relationships, as well as all other elements of the urban structure. It also includes social and cultural practices and values, economic processes, and the intangible dimensions of heritage as related to diversity and identity. It's everything. And it embraces change, and it embraces the social, cultural, economic processes, and diversity. Now, 
much simpler that in Morris maybe put it, and this is where language does matter in his book, The Human Zoo. The human animal requires a spatial territory in which to live that possesses unique features, surprises, visual oddities, landmarks, and architectural idiosyncrasies. And just nearly there, why we do it, why do we care about it all, and back in a sense to language. The project I stumbled upon was at Documenta in Germany, it's an art, contemporary art project. This American artist, the Astro Gates, who had done some very interesting kind of social community planning, mending buildings projects in Chicago, came and recovered a Huguenot house, taking people out of unemployment into employment training. He was asked uh, how he had created an elegance and taste in his projects which involved the mending of houses, and he replied, my knowledge of materials and my access to skilled people plus time created what you call taste. I believe that things in our lives should be cared for. Maria Canerva, a Finnish conservator, presented her personal principles under the title, There Are No Obvious Answers. Well, the stitch in time of preventative maintenance is obvious, and we need a cultural change, and maybe these unreal times can deliver this. Thank you.